over half of your face. So good to be here. As you know, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we want to make sure that we appreciate our pastors. Pastor Green and is Neesley here this morning? Pastor Guerrier, is she here this morning? I know um, at least the other two of our pastors, too, are um, occupied, one in the youth church, and Pastor Green is not here today, so we'll just have to pour it all out on you today, Pastor Green. So here we are. I would like to share with you a poem. It's a very small poem, but it's a thoughtful poem by Ann Peterson, and this is what the poem says. You lead our congregation by opening God's word, and then... You live your lives reflecting all that we have heard. You care for others deeply and lift them up in prayer. And when we face misfortune, we know that you'll be there. We really love you, our pastors, for everything you do. And we thank God for giving us four pastors like you. We are really thankful for you. And we understand that being a pastor is a lot of work on you, but it's also a lot on your families. So our theme for this Pastor Appreciation Month is your favorite things. And last week, I know all of us enjoyed the favorite songs that we did. I'm telling you, they were amazing. Thank you for sharing your favorite songs. And this week, we want to share your favorite food. And so tomorrow, we ask that you home with your family at 4 p.m. Your favorite foods will be delivered to your home at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So for the other pastors, yes, awesome, awesome. And so for the other pastors, we'll let them know, too, that their favorite, favorite dish will be showing up at their house tomorrow. Again, we want to thank you for all that you do. These are little tokens, but little tokens to let you know that we appreciate you and we want to be intentional about thanking you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, oh bless the Lord. <laughs> oh, my soul. A a amen. Oh, praise God. Uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, thank you, church family, so much. And uh, I believe I can speak freely on behalf of the staff. We thank you uh, just for your prayers, your support. Um, we all have been just navigating through very difficult times, um, but you have been there and uh, your prayers keep us going. Um, so thank you, church family, um, for just your love and your support. We just want to remind you too, as well as we are uh, getting ready to transition uh, into our, our divine service, that um, as, as we all know, these are some strange times, and we just want to encourage you to continue to, to work with us as we continue to wear our masks, as we continue to social distance, as we continue to not gather um, so that we can be safe. Um, we just we want to thank you so much for how you have cooperated with us. We want to just encourage you to continue to keep doing what you've been doing as we try to make this a safe space. Um, at this time, we want to just welcome our guests that are here with us uh, this morning. If you're a guest with us for the first time at the Mount Rubidoux Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're just going to ask if you just wave your hand. We're not going to ask you to say anything, but just, just, just wave your hand so we can just see if you're in the building today. Pray, praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, put your hands together, church family. Amen. And what we want to just encourage you to do, because we want to stay in connection and contact with you is if you'll just text Ruby Connect to that number, that's a way for you to stay in connection with our church. We want to stay in connection with you. And we also just want to pray a prayer of blessing over our guests that are here today. And so, Rubido, we're just going to ask that you extend your hand in the direction of where our guests are as we just pray God's blessing upon them today. Eternal Father, we're just thankful today for the opportunity to come into your presence. We're thankful, God, for your mercy and grace that has been extended to us one more time. And I just pray, God, for the guests that have come into this place. I pray, God, that as they, if they've entered into these doors, you know what they stand in need of. And our prayer today is that you would not fail to grant what they are seeking you for. And at the end of the day, we just pray that they, along with us, would encounter you. Have your way today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. 
Uh, the Bible tells us in the Word of God that we're going to bless the Lord at all times. Come on, put your hands together this morning. Can we just celebrate our King of Kings and Lord of Lords today? And we're just thankful that because of His mercies, we are not consumed. Great is the faithfulness of our great God. And so I want to invite you to stand with me as we get ready to just out open up our mouths just in worship and praise God. Yes, stand together. Let us stand together uh, this morning. And let's um, invite the presence of God into this place. Father, we just want to say thank you for being alive. We want to thank you for the breath that is in our bodies. And so today, God, we are determined once again to lift up our voices and praise and worship to you. Have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How's everybody doing today? To appreciate and celebrate our pastors. All the songs that we're doing today are dedicated to our pastors. We want to let them know that we love them and we hope that you recognize one of your favorite songs today. All right, let's put those hands together. Let's lift our voices as we sing.
Thank you, Jesus. He deserves our total praise today because he's been so good. Oh, hallelujah. And because we can worship him, we give him total praise because we know he's not like man. He's a trustworthy God. And we can leave our burdens at his feet. Oh, just lift this praise with us on today. All right, church, let's just lift this up. I will be with you. You all know this. And she's giving me guidance. And at one moment, she paused. She said, may I speak freely? I said, yes, ma'am. She says, listen, lady, you have two choices. You can trust God or you can worry. She says, but you can't do both. She says, you can't hedge your bets on God. You either put it all in or you, you don't bother. She says, don't, don't half step. She says, I don't know your story, but stop half stepping. Don't let the temptations of this world tempt you into not believing God for who he says he is. And I wish I had a good ending to this. I don't. I lost everything. Everything. 
but I'm still here. I am still here because I was, I was confronted with my stuff. And right then and there, I repented. I remembered. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Not because I'm good, but because he is faithful. And so right now, I know you've got stuff on your heart. And I know you've got things on your mind. And, and I know there are troubles at every end and at work and at school and your finances. And people are sick and people are dying. I know all of that. I've experienced it. I'm watching it and all of that. But there is a God who says, I will. So whatever you need him to be for you today, fill in the blanks. Just fill in the blanks. Father God, as we pray, in Jesus' name, we are accepting the promise that you made for us. Your promise is sure. I will never leave you. And so, God, we thank you that you are the kind of God. You are not like us, that your word actually means something. When you say you're going to do it, you do it, and you do it right, and you do it well, and there is nothing else we need to add. And so, God, I bring us before you, before your throne of grace, begging for forgiveness, begging for mercy, begging God that you will come into our hearts, come into our lives and strip us of all the doubt and all the negativity, all the things we're seeing and all the things we're hearing, strip all of that away and give us an ear to hear your words, your voice that says, I will be with you. And so God, fight our battles. You know what's ahead of us. We don't have a clue. God, keep us, because we cannot keep ourselves. Heal us, we cannot heal ourselves. Restore us, oh God, because we have fallen. We cannot pick ourselves up. So God, we look to you. Protect us, protect our children. Touch our loved ones in the hospital. Massage the hearts of those who have become depressed and dejected and have forgotten you who you are. Help those that are unable to be here. Oh God, we need you. We're trying, but Lord, we understand that even our best effort is nothing. And so God, we need your strength. We're asking that you would take over. Do for us what we can never do for ourselves. Save us, oh God, because you promised. Restore us, oh God, you promised. Guide us, oh God, we promise. Heal us, oh God, you promise. Provide, oh God, you promise. And at the end of it all, we will all be able to stand with that testimony and say, God did it. Oh, I have some scars, yes, but God did it. God did it. God did it. He will do it again. He will do it again. He will do it again. If you believe me, he will do it again. Even if you don't believe but you want to believe, put your hands together for the God who will do it again. So God, we thank you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name.
have robbed me. But ye say, therein have we robbed thee. Where, Lord, in tithe and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may not be room enough for you to receive it, and guarantee you that I will pour out a blessing, pour, pour out a blessing, open up your windows, because God is going to pour out a blessing that even you won't have room to receive it. God may have been saying that to Israel, but he's also saying that to us today. But still the question is today, it may seem crazy that God will even have to ask us that question, will a man rob God? And it's not just in your money, but in your talents and in your gifts. Every one of us that are sitting here, everything that we own, even the very breath that we breathe belongs to God. And all he asks us to do is just give 10% of our tithes. He didn't ask for that 90%. He could have flipped it, and then we all would be acting up. But he only asked for 10% because he knows that he does not need that 90%. You need it. And so God is saying to us this morning, if you want to be blessed, if you want to see the guarantee that I will pour out a blessing that you have no room to receive, I dare you to try him today. Let's test God on that today. Let's bring our offering and our tithes and see if we would not have a testimony of how good he has been to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, you don't need anything from us, but you're just trying to get us in the practice and the habits to know that everything belongs to you. And so God, we repent for not giving you back that 10%, not just in our finances, but in our gifts that you have given us and our offerings. And so Lord, today, we're so grateful that you're a second chance God and that means that you have covered everything that we need. And all you're asking us to do is trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm looking to see my windows overflowing where I don't have any room to receive it, that I have to pass it out to my neighbors and friends. And not only that, Lord, let us know that if we bring our tithes into the storeroom, because this is where we, are, we come Sabbath after Sabbath, that you will bless us as we're blessing our pastors and others. So we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. Amen. Amen. Give on any device with online giving from Secure Give. Simply enter your amounts and choose between a one-time or recurring donation. Sign in, sign up, or give quickly as a guest. Select your payment method and complete the transaction. Giving is easy on any device with online giving from Secure Give.
her mother's yeah. side of my arm.
Almighty, please be with your messengers as they battle for you. Grace and mercy, report to duty. Grace and mercy at your service, sir. At ease, soldier. You have been chosen by the Almighty for this task. Any task from the Almighty is a worthy task indeed. I'm ready, sir. This is your assignment. You've been chosen to assist at the dark ages. Wow, this is a serious matter. I'm ready. I'm ready, sir. Remember who you are. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Grace and mercy at your service, sir. What is your report? Sir. From the persecution. The evil grew so rapidly. I couldn't, I couldn't understand how it happened, but it happened. It happened. The persecution stopped, but the deception, the deception, it was much worse. General, people didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Truth was mixed with error. They weren't even able to read their Bibles, and they were okay. Bibles were taken away from them, and people still called themselves Christian. They call themselves Christian. Sir, what can we do about this? I asked, but faithfully, I remembered the Lord's grace and mercy. I remembered that just like he was patient with the people during the time of Noah, that surely he would be patient with his people again. I know the Lord's heart. He waited so long for the people, as evil as they were, as wicked as they were, he waited and waited and waited. Truly the Lord is gracious. Truly the Lord is merciful. And this time, he did it again. How did they respond? God always has a faithful people. Through all the darkness, they simply left, went to the mountain. It was amazing that even in the midst of the darkness, there was a great light shining. They would take pieces of the Bible and hide it in their clothes. They would share wisely pieces of the gospel with those who were willing to listen. Oh, the name of the Lord be praised. The name of the Lord, the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord be praised. May the good Lord be praised. May his people continue to trust in him. Thank you, General. Praise the Lord again, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Blessed? Amen. As I said earlier, we are honoring our pastors for this month for appreciation of our pastors and our clergy. So all the songs that we're doing this month and today are requests from our pastors, their favorite songs or favorite artists that they like. 
And coincidentally, a lot of their songs are songs that we like. <laughs> so we hope that you'll be blessed and that you join in with this worship moment. Amen. You all know this one. This is an oldie but goodie. He's able, right? We know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly all that we can ask or think. Amen. So it's all right to stand on your feet. Get your hands going as we worship God.
hard for him, it doesn't exist. He's an amazing God. And because he's able, because he's amazing, we can say how excellent is your name in all the earth. No name is above his name. We call a lot of names when we get excited. Kobe Bryant, LeBron, yeah. But there's no name like Jehovah, my Savior, my Redeemer. Let's just lift this praise. And Cody's going to do our solo as we start.
more, but if you want us to go, we can go. Keep going. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many of you know God is your everything? Life, breath, joy and sorrow, hope for tomorrow. When you can't call on nobody else in the midnight hour. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. I know you all know this, so sing it with us. Thank you. 
Amen. Let's put our hands together again for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Come on, is he everything to you today? Come on, y'all could do better than that. If that was for me, that'd be good. But if you believe God is everything, come on, put your hands together today. Amen. Amen. We want to thank our music ministry once again. Man, good night. Y'all, y'all, y'all not playing any games, man. Y'all, y'all handling business. Band, praise team. They are doing their thing. And so we praise God as they as they lead us into worship. Amen. As they lead us into the presence of God. We're just thankful today for your ministry. And uh, so we are uh, we're thankful today to continue our uh, our series, um, What If. Uh, but before we do that, uh, there is a member of our pastoral staff that celebrated a birthday this week, Pastor Neasley. And so before, before we begin our message today, and uh, I, I, I know this, this may knock us off just a little bit, but let's get back on. But I, we, we, we are going to sing happy birthday to you today. Now, I'm not going to sing into this mic, saints. I want you all to remain here for the word. <laughs> But I'm going to ask for you to help me just to sing a quick happy birthday to Pastor Neasley. She's a valued member of our team, and we appreciate how God has used her and uses her to be a blessing to the Mount Rubido SCA Church. So on three. There we go. One, two, three. And uh, Pastor Neasley, uh, we just want to make sure you know tomorrow at 4, 4 p.m., your favorite meal is coming your way. So, a a a amen, <laughs> amen. Get ready, get ready. All right, saints, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God. Is that all right? All right, so I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John, the sixth chapter, John chapter 6. And we're going to begin at verse 1, very familiar passage of Scripture, John, the sixth chapter, and we're beginning at verse 1 as we continue our series, What If? What If? And uh, this is what the Word of God says. I'm reading out the New King James Version of the Bible. It says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he had performed, on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. So there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in a number of about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, which, and when he had given thanks, and he distributed them to the disciples, the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. I want us to go back real quick to verse 11, and it says this, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and to the disciples, those sitting down. With your prayers and God's help, I want to just deal with part two of our series, What If? What if we just said thanks? What if we just said thanks? If you'll bow your heads with me as we invite God to be with us today. Father, we just want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, you are you are excellent. You are worthy of all the glory, the honor, and the praise. 
And so now, God, as we just take a few moments to reflect on your word, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My Lord, my strength, and my redeemer, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Just a little bit more on the monitors, please. What if we just said thanks? Uh, for, so as you all know, every single week that I come up here, you all know that this is an opportunity for you to get to know me, and I'm slowly getting to know you as well, or at least half of you, as was mentioned earlier. And uh, one of the things that I believe that you know about our family is that I'm married to a woman who is fam whose family is from Nigeria. A a amen. A amen. Pra praise the Lord. Bless God. And so I've known my wife since sophomore year of high school. And uh, so one of the things, just getting to know her family, uh, being from Nigeria, is I got a chance to know a little bit about the foods from West Africa, right? So a little bit about jollof rice and okra soup and, and fufu. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. I can't really get down with the okra soup, y'all. Now, if you know anything about that okra soup, and you know about okra, man, if you, when, when that thing comes together, it's all, it's all slimy, man. But man, when they take that fufu, and they roll it up into that ball, and they stick it into that okra soup, man, they, be, they run through that thing. And so my wife's family, they are just amazing people. I mean, if my mom and dad, and I know y'all are watching right now, if y'all said we want to move to California next week and live with us, I would be down. I mean, I would welcome that thing. I just, I love my in-laws. And it's crazy because I've been blessed. She has uh, five siblings. And so I have been blessed with four brothers and one additional sister. Um, it is just really a blessing. So one of the things that I've gotten to know, though, about their family is not only uh, just their Nigerian, their Nigerian palate, but this family has an interesting, like, love with game shows. I mean, they are like avid game show like folk. Like, I mean, they, 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 they watch game shows I not even, I have never even heard of or seen. Like, I mean, they love some game shows, but then there's some stuff that, that I'm familiar with that I know, and I'm like, okay, I can get with that. So, you know, if we got any old school game show folk in the house, you know, they, they like Wheel of Fortune, right? They, I mean, they, they, they love the Wheel of Fortune. They, they love Family Feud with Steve Harvey. And they love the old school uh, Family Feud. They, I mean, they love the whole thing. I mean, they, they are game show folk. They, they love Deal or No Deal. And then my wife and my sister-in-law, they got this new thing with Shazam. They, they love some game shows. They love some game shows. But there's, there's one game show that they just love that is just, that's a little bit different than all the different uh, other types of game shows. But they love this game show. And it's the game show called Jeopardy. Do I have any Jeopardy lovers in the house today? They, they love some Jeopardy. And one of the things that you know about Jeopardy, for those of you that are familiar with Jeopardy, is that Jeopardy's a little bit different than all the other game shows, right? It's just, it's just a little bit different. It, if you're familiar with Jeopardy, you know that in Jeopardy, that it's not the answer that brings you through, it's the question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, in order for you to be successful at Jeopardy, for you to be able to win in the game of Jeopardy, you got to know how to ask the right questions. Are, are y'all with me? Because sometimes victory is found in knowing how to ask the right questions. So this, this doesn't only apply to Jeopardy, right? Um, I'm an adjunct professor at Oakwood University, and I've been teaching in that program for a number of years. And one of the things that you want to do with students is you want, for, you want, to, really under, you want to really see that they're getting it. You want to really see that they are progressing. And one of the best ways that you can see that students are progressing in their studies is not always by the answers that they give, but it's also about the questions that they begin to ask. Because how many know today that it's not only the ability to be able to answer some things, but it's also to be able to, the ability to be able to ask 
some questions that determines victory, that determines maturity, that determines progress. It's the ability to be able to look at a situation and ask the right questions. If you're with me, just say amen. See, when you ask the right questions, you're on your way to growing. And how many know that that doesn't only apply in the game of Jeopardy, that doesn't only apply in the classroom with college students, but how many know that that also applies in our spiritual lives? Because in your walk with God, sometimes God looks at us and the way that he knows that we are growing is that he looks at, and, and he hears the types of questions that we ask him. He knows that we're developing as believers. He knows that we're maturing in ministry. He knows that we are moving forward with him because of the type of questions that we begin to ask. Now, I know that some of us in the building today and online are a little bit uncomfortable right now because you've been taught that you're not supposed to ask questions of God. You've been taught that if you were to question God, that it's a sin. That if you were to ever question God, it's a sign that you don't believe. But is there anybody in the building and online that's thankful to know that we serve a God that welcomes questions? We serve a God that's not offended by our questions. God doesn't stop being God just because we ask him a question. God does not get off the throne because we want for him to explain to us why a particular situation happened in our lives. God is not offended by our questions. So as we read through the Bible... What we begin to discover as we talk about questions today is that there are basically two realities we learn in the Word of God about questions. The first reality is the one that we just talked about, and that is that in the Word of God, we see people that ask questions, that their sign of their maturity, the sign that they're moving forward, the sign that they're progressing is the, is, is, is an ind- the indicator of that is the questions that they're asked. That's the first reality. But the second reality that we see in the Word of God as it relates to questions is that there are times where God asks us questions. See, as we look at the Word of God today in our text, we're confronted with this second reality where God is asking a question. Let me provide some context so we can understand the context. Here's Jesus, here's Jesus sitting on the hillside teaching wonderful words of life. And how many know that when Jesus taught, nobody was texting in church? When, when Jesus taught, everybody was wide awake. Yo, Jesus was dropping the words so hard that the Bible says that the folk were there all day and it was so good that they forgot to eat. Yo, Jesus wasn't me. Is there anybody that wishes they could have been there to hear Jesus teach? Like, I mean, Jesus was an amazing teacher. I mean, so good that he held the people spellbound and they forgot that they were hungry. So the Word of God says that they're there, and, 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 and he's preaching, and they are just, they're, just, they're just caught up with the Word. And the Bible says that, as it gets to the end of the day, in verse 5, the Bible says that when Jesus looks up and he sees the multitude there, he asks Philip a question. He says to him, where shall we buy bread for all these people? to eat. And here we see that second reality right there. We're confronted with it where God is asking a question. And here's the thing, like, look, reality is that man may ask questions that they don't know the answer to, but how many know? And how many love the fact that when Jesus or God asks you a question, he already knows the answer to that question. And so we look here and we wonder, like, if Jesus already knows the answer to the question, why is he asking it? But is there anybody that just recognizes in your own spiritual life that sometimes what God does is he'll ask us a question to teach us how to wait on him and listen to what his answer is? Look, can we be honest? We don't like that. Like, 
We literally think we have the answer to everything instead of just waiting on God and letting God begin to speak those things into our life. And so, so, and so what we got to get to, saints of God, is we just got to get to a place where we learn to be quiet. We got to get that Ezekiel anointing. Somebody say Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the Bible says this, there was like a, a valley full of dry bones. And the Spirit of God comes, and God comes to the prophet Ezekiel, and all these dry bones are in the valley. And God says to Ezekiel, he asks him a question. He said, son of man, will it, all these bones live? Now, Ezekiel, he had already learned this lesson. And so he, instead of him saying the answer, he just says to God, you know, Lord. Because he knows that what God is trying to get him to do is to learn to wait and to listen to what his answer is. And how many know that sometimes God may come to you and say, how are you going to fix that job situation? Instead of you opening up your mouth and talking, you need to just be quiet and just say, you know, Lord. Some of us right now, God comes and he asks you the question about how are you going to fix that kid situation? How are you going to help your kids to come to a knowledge of God? Instead of you opening up your mouth with an answer, you ought to just shut your mouth and just say, you know, Lord. Some of us right now, we're in church and we're like, God, how are you going to fix this church situation? Shut your mouth. Wait on God and just simply acknowledge you. No, Lord. Because we've got to, hear me, saints, we've got to realize that when he asks us a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He knows exactly what he's doing, but he wants to get us to a place where we can grow and learn to wait on what he has to say instead of answering it for ourselves. If you understand it, just say amen. And so when God, he he, he enters and he, he begins to ask this question. And, 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 and the Bible says right after that, that the reason why he asked this question is he, he's trying to grow him. He's trying to develop him. He's trying to get the disciples to grow and to develop. But the Bible says he does this and it's a test. It's a what, everybody? Because when you look at verse 6, the word of God says this. It says, when he, he said this to him to test him for he himself knew what he was going to do. So Jesus was not asking a question that he did not know the answer to. He knew exactly what he was going to do, but he was allowing the disciples to be placed in a position where they could grow, where they could develop, where they could become what he has called them to be. Now, it's an interesting thing who Jesus asked. Now, you know, there was a few other disciples that were a little bit more vocal. You had your boy Peter. Peter always was ready for a mic. Like, if there was a mic, Peter was going to be right there. He was going to open up the door. He was going to say something. But there was a few disciples that really didn't say much that we don't really ever hear from. And Philip is one of those guys that we really don't hear from that much. And so it's interesting that the Bible says that instead of Jesus asking Peter, James, or John, he asked Philip. But what we discover as we look through the Gospels is that Philip was actually from the area where this was taking place. And so here's Philip, one of the guys that doesn't really get asked about a lot of stuff. You know, we, we're not hearing much about Philip, but we discover that this is Philip's area. And, and, and so the Bible says that Jesus asked him, and, and it's all the disciples, he's asking him this question to test him. He, he's from his area. And so what we could, what we could deduce from that is that Jesus is asking Philip this question because if he's from the area, he most likely knows where the resources are. See, if anybody could get food in this area, it's Philip. If anybody knows where the Costco is, it's your boy Philip, right? And so he asked Philip, He's testing him. He asks him, man, where can we get bread so that we can feed all these people? Because you know where the resources are. This is your hometown area. You know where all the, you know where the restaurants are. You know where the Costco, the Walmart, you know where everything is. Philip, where should we find the bread so that we can feed all these people? And what Philip is confronted with, hear me, saints, what he is faced with in this moment 
is he has to decide in this moment, am I going to begin to rely upon my ability or what God can provide? And he's faced with this in this moment because he knows the landscape, because he knows the territory, and because he knows where the resources are, he's asked this question to test him. And there are moments, saints of God, when God will bring you to a moment, where he'll bring you to a point in your life that even the resources that you have can't meet the need that you have. Anybody ever been there before? And there are moments in our lives where there's this incredible gap between what I have and what I need. And that's what we're faced here, right? That's what we're faced with right here in the text. God is saying, hey, Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? The Bible tells us there are 5,000 men. That's not counting women and children. So most likely there's about 10,000 people there total. And he's asking Philip because Philip knows where the resources are, because Philip is from the area, because Philip knows the landscape. He asked Philip to test him. Yo, where are we going to get bread to feed all these people? And then we hear from Andrew, and Andrew tells us all we got is a boy with one lunch that has five barley loaves and two sardines. Now, we got 10,000 people, and we got some biscuits and some sardines. Is there anybody that recognizes that that's a huge gap? Like, and so here's Philip now. He's hearing from Andrew, and he realizes that the resources he has is not going to cut it. It's not going to meet this thing. And, 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 and he knows that although he knows the area, although he's an expert, although this is his hometown, although he knows where the resources are, he recognizes in this moment that he's not going to be able to bridge this gap. And how many of us have been in those situations before? I can think about times in ministry where the gap between what I had and what I needed was just too great. I remember in Tuscaloosa, I'll say roll tide again. Thank you. There we go. We're going to convert this church. Amen. I remember in Tuscaloosa, man, we, man, God was just doing a work. Man, we were doing work in the community, and we needed a church bus. And it was just a little small church. We were trying to figure out how in the world we were going to do it. And so, man, I remember, man, and y'all, please don't judge me here. Y'all already know that I, uh, I'm a pack rat and I'm recovering and all that other stuff. So I, I've, just been, I've just been confessing to y'all, man. So, like, so I remember, man, we were trying to figure out how we were going to get the funds for this thing. And I'm trying to, like, depend on the Lord and trying to depend on what he's going to do. But then I just remember, like, sometimes you get to that little area where maybe you're not believing as much. And so you would... You know, just kind of mention to somebody, yeah, man, we're just, and you do it real spiritual, man, we're just praying for God to, to work in this situation. I mean, we just need the Lord to show up and show out with $1,999.53. We just need him to come through because there are moments, saints of God, where we, when we peruse the landscape, when we look over the landscape, God goes, what are you going to do with this? And we're not really, Lord, the gap is just, it's too great. There's this 9,999 gap between what I have and what I need. It kind of reminds me of this little boy, his parents, he was, they were tucking him into bed and he was praying in his room. And he said, Lord, I just need you to bless mommy. I need you less daddy. And God, I want a bike. And the mother asks, like, yo, God is not deaf. And the mother responds, yes, but grandma in the next room is. <laughs> and so what often happens, saints of God, is that we end up looking to other people to meet a need instead of depending on God. And is there anybody in the room that's ever yelled louder to people than you have to God? 
as we look at this text, I think that we can all agree that in John 6, there's this huge gap between what they had and what they needed, between what the disciples possessed and what they needed to meet the challenge. One lunch, and you've got 10,000, you need 10,000 lunches. One little boy with these barley loaves and fishes, and you've got this, this huge gap. And I, and I realize in this room today that all of us living on planet Earth, that we all have faced that 9,999 gap in our lives, where you got to the place where what you've got and what you need, there was just such a large gap and it was, you were not able to fill it. To some of us here today, that, that, that there's, there's ways that you were trying to see that thing reconciled. And, and let me make this clear, that this is not just a physical gap. This is just not a monetary gap. Yes, there are times where in our lives that we have this gap of what we, what we have and what we need, and it's just so great. But it's not only physical. It's not only monetary. Sometimes that 9,999 that, that 9, gap goes way beyond that. Sometimes what I need is just more strength. But the strength I have right now in COVID, in this pandemic, is not sufficient. The gap is too great. Sometimes it's a gap of hope. Sometimes it's a gap for faith. Sometimes it's a gap for vision or just for some sanity. It doesn't even come close. You, you're like, God, like, I see what is needed, but what I have and what I need, the gap, is just too great. It could be a failing marriage for somebody where you feel the gap is just too large. You've lost the emotion. You've lost the love. You've lost the desire for your spouse. And the gap between you, it's just, it's just too great. Like, there, there's some of us, it's just the peace of mind. Like, it's just the gap between fear and between peace. It's just this huge gap, and there's just nothing to bridge it. Some of us, again, we just need strength right now in this moment to do what we are called to do. But the gap is just too great. Sometimes I think, saying to God, that some of the folks that have the biggest gaps is our single parents in the house. I can only imagine right now as I'm trying to just do what I'm doing with my kids. Man, if I did not have my wife, man, yeah, I mean, jokers would be going, we would be going crazy right now. But for those people that are single parents, where you got to be mom and dad, where you got to discipline and you got to tutor, where you got to be the spiritual leader of the home and you got to work maybe one and two jobs, it's like this 9,999 gap. It's like, what do we do at this point? And God looks at Philip, and he says, you're from here. This is your hometown. What do we do? You're the man. You know the landscape. What do we do at this point? Every one of us, we're faced with this gap. But I need you to know today, saints of God, that the only person that can connect what I got and what I need is Jesus Christ himself. And the reality is that you may try to find ways to fill the 9,999 gap in your life, but you'll always come up short if you leave God out of the equation. You can stick a whole bunch of stuff in that gap. You can stick relationships in that gap. You can stick finances in that gap. You can stick other jobs into that gap. You can do everything else. But the reality is that if Jesus is not in the equation, you're going to come up short every single time. There's a story about a billionaire whose body was just filled with cancer and literally he only had a few months to live. He was wondering, how do you fill that gap? What money fixes that? If I just had a little bit more money, if I just had more... If God is not in the equation, you'll always come up short for that 9,999 gap. It's, gonna be, it's, just, it's just too huge. And so, Philip... You can go wherever you want to go. You can do whatever you want to do. 
But the bottom line is that you can only fill the gap with Jesus. He's the only one that can fill that equation. He's the only one that can do that. I'll never forget um, just, you know, the journey here to California has been just a step of faith for us. And one of the things that we were concerned about is just about our children. One of the things that God has convicted us in our family is that we want to put our children in Christian education. That's a value. That's something that we want to do. And so I'll just, I remember um, our kids were at Oakwood Academy in Huntsville. It's a Christian school there. And uh, we wanted to put them in Christian education here. Now, as you all know, as I've mentioned before, that everything up in here is like double the cost. Amen. Yo, put your hands together, man. Y'all, y'all, the Lord has been keeping us, man. Amen. Can we thank God for keeping us in California? Are there any witnesses that are thankful that you got food? Amen. That somehow, someway, you got a roof over your head. That you were able to drive here today in expensive California. Amen. Oh, bless his name. And so, literally, guys, I, I, I'm telling y'all, the, the tuition at Oakwood, in comparison to the tuition here at any of the schools, I mean, any of the schools. I mean, that thing is almost double. No exaggeration. And so, as you all know, we have five kids, four school age. Help us, Lord. <laughs> We're talking about a big gap now. Come on. <laughs> Between what I got <laughs> and what I need. But I need somebody to know today that we serve a God. That when you put him in the equation, that God will fill every single gap. And I need you to know that God in his mercy, God in his faithfulness, as we walk forward in obedience, all four of them kids, they're in church school. Amen. God has made a way out of no way because only God can do that, saints of God. And the reality is that God will never ask you a question that he doesn't already have the answer for. Hey, Green family, how are you going to put your kids in church school in California when the tuition is almost double what you were paying in Huntsville, Alabama. You know, Lord. <laughs> and for, for somebody in this room right now, that's just, that's, that's got to be your only reason. Lord, as long as you're in this equation, you know. Somebody right now, you're facing that gap in your life right now, and you're wondering how God is going to work it out. And I'm telling you today that God is faithful, that God is willing to do what he says he will do. He's willing to fill that 9,999 gap in your life if you allow him to be in the equation. I'm telling you, only God could do what I'm talking about. Only God could do that. And that's what God wants to do for you. And so the question, as we get ready to close, how does that gap, how does that gap get filled? We, as long as Jesus is in the equation between what I got and what I need, like, what does God do? How does it all happen? We all know the story. Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fishes, and he starts to fill the gap. He takes that one lunch and he fills that 9,999 gap. 10,000 people he feeds with just that one lunch. Two sardines and five biscuits. And I mean, the folk were hungry, and we're not talking about hungry, we're talking about that angry hungry, like the Snickers commercial, y'all ever seen that? You don't even have to see that, look in the mirror, you, you know. Like, you may be angry hungry right now, you're like, Pastor, if you don't hurry up and finish this word right now, but look at what Jesus does, y'all. 
We close it now. Verse 11. Look at what Jesus does. It says, he gave thanks and then distributed it. All right, I'm just going to. He gave thanks and then he distributed it. Somebody's looking at the preacher and it's like, yo, that's it? That's it. He gave thanks. Just, just, just think of this for a moment, saints of God. He took the loaves and the fishes, the biscuits and the sardines, and he fills the gap. But notice in the prayer, he doesn't even pray for bread and fish. Yo, it's not that we don't make our requests known. It's not that we don't tell God what we need. But the theme of his prayer wasn't request. The theme of his prayer was thanks. He did not even pray for the bread and the fish. He just simply prays. I just want to thank you, God. I just want to thank you that you're in charge. I just want to thank you that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I just want to thank you, God, that you supply for my every need. I want to thank you that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. I just want to thank you that you are the one that's over the fish, that you can multiply the fish. Never once does he pray for the bread and the fish. The Bible just simply says, and he gave thanks. And that reminds me of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Don't worry about nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the problem with many of us is that the theme of our prayer often is just, "What, Lord, give me this. Lord, I need that. But what God wants to move us to is he wants to get us to a place where when we enter into his presence— we enter into his presence with thanksgiving. I want to thank you, God, that you're in charge. I want to thank you, God, that you're on the throne. I want to thank you, God, for what you are doing. I want to thank you that your timing is better than mine. I want to thank you, God, that you know better than I do. I trust you, God. I honor you, God. How, how many know in this place that we just got to get to the place where we just say thanks. It's this huge gap. 9,999 gap. They didn't know how it was going to be filled. But Jesus shows us, it's simple. Just give thanks. Let your prayers be permeated with thanksgiving. I thank you, God, in this COVID space that you know what I need before I ask. I thank you, God, that although I don't know how it's working out, you're working it out for my good. I just simply want to thank you. Somebody here today, you've just been like, God, I've got this gap. It's so great. And I've been doing everything to try to fill it. I didn't put God in the equation. I've gone to every counselor, not that counseling is bad. I tried to work extra jobs, that, that working extra jobs is bad. But you have not been in the equation. And as many times I try to fill these gaps, it'll never get filled as long as you're on the outside and not on the inside. I don't know about you today, but if there was ever a time I needed God to fill the gap, it's right now. And where God's got us, y'all, let's just be real. For so many of us that are experts in the field, 
So many of us that understand the landscape of our lives, God has brought us to a place where the gap is so great that your training is not sufficient, your education is not enough, your money is not making it happen. You're at a spot right now where you are brought to a place where the only thing you can depend on right now is God. See, God, God, his desire is he wants to just get us to a place where we're like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where his strength is made perfect in our weakness. That's the lesson that he is trying to get us to understand in these times. So there's somebody here today, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Just, just, just stand, pull out your phones while you're standing. Come on, everybody, just stand with me real quick. If you live on planet Earth, you got a gap. I don't care who you are. I don't care the person that looks in this building like they've got it all together. Every one of us in this room and online, if you live on this Earth, you have a gap. And God has brought you to this church on this day. He's got you online tuning in on this day because he wants for you to allow for him to be a part of the equation. You've been trying to do it on your own. You've been leaning on your own understanding, your own training, your education, all the stuff that none of that is going to meet the moment. God, where are we going to find bread to feed all these people. God, how are we going to work this family situation out? God, how are you going to give it to Jesus? And so I need everybody right now, wherever your phone is, just, just hold up. Get your phone out. Get your phone out. Everybody pull your phone out right now. Everybody, everybody pull your phone out. Pull your phone out. On the screen behind me, there's somebody here today that the Spirit of God has convicted you today, that you've seen now, man, I've been trying to fill some gaps in my life without including God in the equation. And what God wants to do for you today is he wants for you to allow him to fill that gap. But you gotta surrender to Jesus. You got to wave the white flag today and say, God, I've been trying to fill these gaps. And every single time I come up short, God, I need you to fill the gap. If that's you today, I'm just going to ask, there should be a, 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 a slide on the screen right now that I need you to text next steps to that number. And what, what, what will happen is that one of our Bible counselors, they're going to call you, they're going to call to pray, they're going to call to encourage you, whatever you need. This is not just for people in the building. If you're online and God is speaking to you and you're just sensing just a need for God to be a part of the equation, I want to invite you to just go ahead and text next steps to that number and allow for God to do a work, to do something for you that you can't even imagine. You're not at this place by accident. He doesn't ask you questions that he don't already know the answer to. You're here on purpose because he's trying to do something in your life. My second appeal is really simple. There's some folk here today that you just need to start thanking God. You need to just say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, that my family is intact. I thank you, God, that although I may be divorced, I'm still in my right mind. You need to just thank God today 
And so I want to give you a few moments, just you and God, you and God right now. I just want to give you a few moments, just you and him, to just say thank you. Give you, I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now, just close, just you and God. Just, just tell him thank you today. you'll bow your heads with me as we close today. Father, we just want to thank you so much for being a God that doesn't ask questions that you don't already know the answer to. And Father, there's folk in this room right now that you've brought to some spots, some moments where God, we recognize that what we have and what we need is not sufficient. There's a gap and I pray, God, for those in this room and online that, Father, you would help them to recognize that that gap can only be filled when you're a part of the equation. I'm praying, God, for a spirit over our church, a Philippians 4, 6, and 7 spirit, that we'll not be anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, that we'll let our requests be made known unto you. And you promise us in verse 7 that the peace of God, that passeth all understanding, and we need peace right now, God. The peace of God, that passeth all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to just give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Come on, put your hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. right after church anyone who's interested in serving with the youth or anyone who's interested to at least find out what it is that they need please see pastor kyle he is outside or you can contact him at 951-414-9348 pastor kyle is outside lunch has been prepared at the home of one of our youth leaders and anybody and everyone who's interested even if you're not sure, go get some good food and ask some questions, right? We've been, we've, been, we've been encouraged to ask the right questions, amen? Amen. So Pastor Carl is in the lobby. Next week, Ruby Reed, which is our book club, will feature Sister Cassandra Willis. And those of you who know, know she has an amazing testimony. She will be with us for Ruby Reed 
All the information is on the Facebook page, how you can join in on Zoom. Please bring a friend, buy the book, let's support our own, amen. October 30th, we are going to have a ministry fair. What did I say? Right, so what this ministry fair is all about is all the ministries in the church will be there and we will give you an opportunity to connect with them and find out how you can serve. Get some information. This is our church and God is calling us to pull our hands together, roll up our sleeves and get to work. Amen? Now, hallowed be thy name, October 31st. I'm so excited. I'm like a big kid at heart. Hallowed be thy name. Tickets are on Eventbrite and the tickets are going fast. So if you have not made a, a, a decision, don't wait until like the day before and hound Pastor Green because he will not be able to help you. Um, get your tickets now. Invite your friends. Invite the neighbors. Invite the kids that normally go trick-or-treating. Tell them you've got another option for them. All right, This is an easy way to spread the gospel and you don't have to lift a finger but to invite. Amen? Amen. Also, the children's department, Pastor um, Jeremiah, is looking for volunteers for that day. And so look at your calendar, move some things around. This is for us. This is for our children. This is for our community. This is why we're here, right? To be, to show the people what God can do in their lives. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to let us stand up for our benediction. Oh, God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that you are the kind of God who fills in the gap. God, I thank you that you don't expect us to come up with the 99, 9,000, but you, you got this. And all we have to do, we have the easy, we have such an easy job. It's to just trust you and thank you. And when the, when the question comes to just say, Lord, I look to you. And so, God, I pray as we go throughout this week, and yes, we will have challenges. You already know what those challenges are, but God, I thank you that you're going to remind us as they come up that we will look up and say, God, I'm looking to you, who is the author and the finisher of my faith. And so as we go, let's depart to serve. Let's put in our hearts and our mind that God has got this, that the worrying is not going to change anything, but the faith and the giving of things, that will move you. Not just a message for us, but let us share with people we know to trust you. So God, I thank you for what you have done for us. I thank you for this word today. I thank you for what you will continue to do for us. But more than anything, God, I thank you for Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.